I'm so sorry. I did not realize that um, you know, the thing was muted. So yeah, I'll have to explain this again. Let's do this. Let's start over. Uh, so uh, as I was saying, in um, like Nina has posted over here, um, she's talking about Second Corinthians five ten, uh, which talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And then you have another kind of judgment seat mentioned in Revelation twenty, and that is called the white throne judgment ju seat. White throne. It's just called the white throne. So. Um, there are two different seats of judgment. So here in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it's the believers who will be judged, whereas in uh, Revelation 20, it's the unbelievers who will be judged. And all judgment is just based on one single thing, whether or not you have been cleansed of your sins by the blood of Jesus and been granted his perfect righteousness. So all the people standing in front of the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.20, they are all standing over there, completely washed of all of their sins and wearing the, um, the righteousness of Jesus, the perfect righteousness of Jesus. So because they are perfectly righteous, as righteous as Jesus is righteous, they are guaranteed their place in heaven, where only the righteous, righteous can live. The in Revelation 20, the unbelievers who are over there, they might have done a lot of good works, but they were they, they do not have the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Their sins have not been washed by the blood of Jesus. So no matter how nice they may be as people, they will you know end up in hell. So over there in Revelation 20, the judgment is being given regarding which level of judgment they are going to receive. Is it going to be something very harsh? A very harsh level of judgment may be reserved for people who are, you know, murderers and people like uh, Hitler uh, who massacred, uh, you know, lakhs of people. So the judgment is regarding uh, the levels of judgment which would be given to different unbelievers. Here in 2 Corinthians 5.20, the judgment is, uh, is an assessment of um, what kind of a reward you should be given. So someone who has served the Lord wholeheartedly will probably receive a greater reward than someone else who has not done much. Okay, so um, works are not being judged at all over here um, 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 e e with regard to salvation. The works are being judged only to assess what level of reward should be given. So just to clarify, in uh, when it talks about uh, here when Jesus talks about branches which will be taken away, which will be cut down, which will be burnt, he is talking about um, people who no longer want him to be their savior. At one point they came to him and they said, you are our Lord, you are our master and we want to follow you. But now they have completely turned away from him and now they are no longer even his followers because that's what Hebrews chapter 6 talks about. It talks about a class of people who tasted of the heavenly gift, who participated in the Holy Spirit, who were given uh, the word and cleansed by it, who enjoyed the, uh, the benefits of the, uh, you know, the, the heavenly uh, realm which is to come. They, they were given all of that, but they forsook it and they turned their backs on him. Oh, so regarding such people, it is told over there in Hebrews 6 that there is no more uh, you know, um, redemption for them. There is no more forgiveness for them and that there is only judgment awaiting them. So here, most probably, that is the kind of people that Jesus is talking about when he says branches which are no longer yielding fruit because they have chosen to cut themselves off from him. They have gone back to other masters and there is no desire inside them for repentance anymore. They have no desire whatsoever to come back to him and ask for forgiveness even. They are happy where they are out in the world again. So Jesus here is probably only referring to branches that you know are going to be thrown into the fire because of that final ultimate decision which they have taken. It is not referring to people who maybe have not borne enough fruit. So 
if I have done 10,000 good deeds, and if my friend has done 1 million good deeds, Jesus is not going to say, oh, this woman has only done 10,000 good deeds. Let's you know chop her off and put her in the fire. No, because in um, this uh, eternal decision about my eternal future is not determined on the basis of my works. It is based on his perfect righteousness, which is given to me freely. So um, at in 2 Corinthians 5.20, uh, uh, only assessment of what kind of a reward I should receive, you know, that is the only assessment and judgment which will be done. It is not a judgment regarding whether I would uh, be destined for hell or not. Okay, so the, that's just one clarification. Now, so do you have a question beyond whatever I have said, Nina? Oh, yeah, you have a question here. The dividing line would be cutting themselves off from Christ. Um, this is just something which I had read about a long time ago. Don't remember the name of the person anymore. Um, he professed himself to be a true Christian. In fact, he was in ministry even. And then for some reason, he became disillusioned. And he said, uh, uh, I don't believe in this Christ anymore. I believe he exists, but I do not want to have anything more to do with him. And uh, so he went and started some kind of uh, cult uh, under one of the wing streams of Hinduism, you know, so he actually he he stepped away altogether from his master Christ, and he said, "I know Christ exists, but because he's done this, 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 I do not believe him in him anymore." And uh, he actually went and started another uh, cult of his own, uh, um, which is some, some stream of Hinduism. So um, there are people like that who might have genuinely considered themselves followers of Jesus, but then they took a stand and said, we don't want this master anymore. We don't believe in him anymore. So it would probably apply only to such people, you know. Um, so such people, because they are no longer attached to the wine, now they can do nothing. You can't bear fruit unless you're attached to the wine. So in that sense, because they are no longer bearing any fruit, they would be taken and thrown into the fire. Jesus is not talking about somebody who's done more good works, who's done less good works, and based on that, no. It's talking about someone who's no longer under Jesus' covering, has taken a stand and said, I do not want this Lord and Master. And there is no uh, room for repentance anymore. You know, that person does, does not wish to repent. Only the Lord can look at a person's heart and know whether they have crossed that line or not. We cannot go judging you know, each other and pointing fingers and saying, oh, that person has crossed the line. I mean, what do we know? Maybe they, deep down in that heart, that person still has a small spark which can grow into repentance, a desire to change. We, we do not know. So we cannot judge. But the Lord who can look into hearts will be able to know whether a person has crossed that line or not. Now, does that help, Nina? Or, and do you have any other follow-up questions? No. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So, yes, that is clear. So I just wanted the dividing line because this is also, I mean, like uh, the branches which are going to be in the fire. So now it is kind of clear that it is, it is finally people who disassociate themselves completely from Christ. I think we can understand it that way. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 is about the rewards that are going to be given according to the fruitfulness of a believer, believer, it may vary from believer to believer. But that will, and so, but so accordingly, the rewards would vary. But apart from that, uh, there is no, uh, you know, that kind of judgment that, I mean, what does it mean when, sorry, uh, in Romans, it's talking about like all the secrets will be laid bare before the Lord. And, you know, so what judgment is that? It's Romans 2, it's at the end of Romans second chapter. So that it says about it, you're going to be the judgment of God is based on truth and uh, works and the amount of knowledge that a person has. But finally, it ends with saying that he will be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So is, is it a, a, a good to conclude that when you say gospel of Jesus Christ, it means about the relationship of the person to Jesus Christ, whether it is yes or a no. And is judgment based on that is what I wanted to know. Yeah, because gospel finally, uh, at the core of the gospel is this thing. 
are your sins washed or not are you still you know uh, rotting in your sinfulness or has it been cleaned and cleansed and taken away that is only through the blood of jesus christ so that is point 1 and point 2 if he has cleansed you then he he gives you his perfect righteousness it's not a 99% righteousness it's 100% yeah. you are as righteous as jesus and that only he can give so once you have that that is it that is the gospel the good news that you have been freely given this status and because of which you will now have a room in the father's family literally so um if a person has that then yes they have a room waiting for them on the other hand if they do not have this cleansing and this righteousness of of jesus then they will not even enter into heaven and uh, so uh, these second corinthians 5 10 believers are all have that status already they're already standing over there clothed in jesus christ perfect 100% righteousness so there's no question of them you know being sent off to hell this person who uh, went away from jesus and said you know i no longer want him because he was disillusioned regarding whatever um so that person is saying i no longer want the benefits which were given to me you know there were those things which hebrew 6 talks about so he tasted of the heavenly gift he partook of the holy spirit but he said i do not want um, this anymore and he deliberately walked away so like you use the word disassociated disassociated yeah i think that would be a correct word yeah so yes all right thank you thank you thank you for the clarity yeah thank you so yes um let's uh, look at verses 9 to 15 there are some good points which are brought out here so yes let's actually uh, read these verses uh, chapter 15 verses 9 to 15 if someone could read out Uh, verse nine. As the father, as the father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I, I have loved you. greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends you are my friends if you do what if you are my friends if you do whatever i commanded you no longer do i call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing but i have called you friends for all things that i heard from my father i have made known to yeah so here you know jesus is bringing out that love relationship which now exists between him and his followers so he says you know he doesn't say over here as the father has loved me so have i loved you now continue to earn my love he does not say that he's not talking about us needing to earn his love he says now remain in my love you have been loved you're already loved now all you need to do is remain in my love so we don't do these uh, good works to earn his love we are loved even when we were yet sinners we were loved he was willing to you know prepare a sacrifice god was willing to prepare a sacrifice for us because we were loved and all we need to do is just stretch out our hand and accept that sacrifice and say yes i want this sacrifice to you know uh, work on my behalf and i want to be cleansed and i want to start a new life so uh, we have we have always been loved so it's not about want needing to earn his love we do good works to remain inside the safe boundaries of this love because when we sin and we are enticed by satan and taken away we he makes us go outside that those boundaries of protection where we and our family may be harmed where doors will be opened for the evil one to come in and get a foothold and do things to us which the lord does not want done so it's satan who tries to take us outside the boundaries the safe boundaries of his protection so he says remain in my love you know you, you I, i he says as the father has loved me how, to what extent did the father love jesus 
I mean, it, it's beyond 100%. So he says, to that extent, I have loved you people. So you're that loved. Now stay inside the safe boundaries of this love. Remain in my love. Okay, so, um, uh, and so he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So he's not saying, you know, do the, uh, the you know, keep these hundred rules, uh, keep these hundred do's and don'ts because only then you have any hope. No, he's saying, if you walk in the way I'm asking you to walk, it will help you to stay in my love. And it, my love for you is not a shallow love. I love you as completely as the Father loves me. I love you to that level. So stay inside the safe boundaries of my love by doing what I'm asking you to do. You know, live according to the Father's commands. Um, so, and so in, you know, in line with that same thought about uh, this love relationship that, the, that God has with us, he goes on to talk about how our status has changed now. You know, earlier we were slaves of sin. Um, sin um, controlled us. And because sin was, uh, we were slaves to sin, the demons also, you know, uh, had an opening into our lives. They too could suppress us, oppress us, and enslave us as well. So we became slaves not just of sin, but even of the uh, demons because of our sinful nature. That is what we were. But now he says our status has changed completely. And he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you, he says. So what's the point being brought out over here? Um, let's say that a lady and I are having a conversation and I say to this lady, I say to her, you know, once you've cleared all the, uh, you know, cleared up the table, could you please take the glassware and put the, put it in the shelf? Now, if this lady that I'm speaking to is a servant, then because I have ordered her to clear up the glassware and put them in the shelf, she will do it because the order has been given and I'll be paying her for her services later. On the other hand, the lady that I'm speaking to is a friend of mine. It's not, she's not going to you know, do it out of any sense of obligation or because I'm going to pay her. She understands my heart. She knows how valuable that glassware is for me. You know, and so out of love, she'll be make she'll make sure that once the table is cleared, she'll make sure that all the glassware goes back into the shelf safely because she understands my heart. So it's not a command that I'm giving to her. The entire relationship is so different. She understands how I feel about this particular set of glassware. And so she does that out of love, out of you know um, her interests being synchronized with my interests. The servant, on the other hand, does it you know, either willingly or grudgingly because you know she has to. And in case she breaks any of it, you know, I'll probably you know, make her um, uh, pay for it or whatever. So this that whole relationship is a very um, um, low level, at a very low level. On the other hand, this friend relationship, over there it's not about someone commanding and you obeying the command. You agree because that person is your friend and you know what they're saying. You understand their heart and you care about what they care about. So you see, that is the, the status to which now Jesus has taken us. So he says, if you remain in my love and you keep the fa my father's command, then you will remain in his love the way I do. And then the whole thing will not be a very business kind of you know, transaction where I'm, I'm telling you to do something and then you have to do it because if you, if, if you do it, then you'll get blessed. If you don't do it, you won't get blessed. No, it's not about that. It's a secure love relationship where rewards are given out of love. You know, so we just... <laughs> Which is what, you know, we, we talk so much about the size of our crowns and uh, the reward which is going to be given to us when we're standing over there in front of the judgment seat of Christ and all of that. But one um, parable which Jesus used always comes back to my mind. You know, he, uh, you have these uh, laborers who go into the vineyard. Some of them are slogging over there in the vineyard from morning. And then there are these guys who join in the last minute in the evening. You know, when, when, when there's just about one or two hours left. And the master gives them all the same amount. And the guys have been working since morning and you know, literally sweating um, you know, their, their skin out. They're really upset and they say, we should, shouldn't we get higher wages? 
and the owner says this is my money to give i'll give how much ever i want to whomever i want i want to give everyone the same so you know what's it to you so i think um, the way he is going to be assessing performance and uh, giving the rewards is all going to be very different it's all going to be about relationship it's about how much you understood his heart and walked with him i don't think it's all going to be real performance based you know because talents also differ and uh, so he's the way he's going to be doing his entire reward will be like real eye opener on that day when we're all standing over there so i think the ones who just loved him with all their heart are the ones who will um, just you know uh, receive the biggest thank you and just be really grateful you know that they got that kind of a thank you from him i do i don't think even the size of the crown and all will really matter that much at that time um, you know so i think it's all going to be that love relationship how much we understood it and how much we walked in it and how secure we were in it you know so i think that will probably matter the most even even when it comes down to rewards and performance and all of that uh, yeah so uh, he says you are now my friends i no longer call you servants and everything my father has revealed to me i'm sharing that with you because so that you also can you know uh, partner with me in the same way i have partnered with the father up to now uh, is what he's trying to get across to them and uh, then you know he talks about uh, the um, The, the tough side of being a disciple so that would be verses 16 to 20 um maybe we can read uh, uh, 16 to 25 yeah that that would be one chunk so yes uh, chapter 15 16 to 25 you did not choose me but i chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name he may give you these things i command you that you love on another if the world hates you you know that it has hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world would love its own yet because of you are not of the world but i chose you out of the world therefore the world hates you remember the word that i said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will also persecute you if they kept my word they will keep yours also but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they did not know him who sent me if i had not come and spoken to them they would have no sin but now they have no excuse for their sin he who hates me hates my father also if i had not done among them the works which no one else did they would have no sin but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father but this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law they hated me without a cause yeah there's a contrast being drawn over here between two uh, you know the same phrases are being used uh, to bring out two different things in verse 16 if you see he says you did not choose me but i chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that's what he has chosen us for and then in verse 19 again he uses that same you know uh, phrase about being chosen and he says over there as it is you do not belong to the world but i have chosen you out of the world that is why the world hates you so there's a contrast being drawn over here about how we have been chosen by jesus to bear fruit and fruit which remains and whatever we ask of the father he will give so it's blessing and fruitfulness that is what he has chosen us for but there's another side to this choosing because he has chosen us out of the world the world is going to hate us the world is going to try to make life as miserable as possible for us so there is this other side to it as well and uh, so he tells them if they persecuted me they will persecute you also because you see the all these beautiful things that he's been telling them about the uh, the privileges which they can have as branches in in the true vine 
he doesn't want them to just walk away with only that information he also wants them to realize that they're going to be on, under attack the more fruit they bear in fact the more they're going to come under attack so he, he wants them to be forewarned he's going to, he's telling them you are you have been chosen and appointed for blessing you have been chosen and appointed for fruitfulness you have been chosen and appointed for a zoe abundant life that is what you've been chosen for but because i have chosen you out of the world and now you are no more a part of the world the world's going to hate you you will suffer persecution you will go through hardships so this is something that they needed to understand that you know they would be hated without any reason that's what jesus says about himself in verse 25 he says this is to fulfill what is written in their law they hated me without reason this is basically referring to psalm 35 verses 19 to 28 where it says that the enemies are gloating over the psalmist without any cause and they are hating him without reason and maliciously you know speaking against him uh, so um, uh, so here uh, that what the psalmist said not only referred to the personal life of the psalmist it was also in a way prophesying about uh, Jesus who would come later so Jesus says that in the same way they hated me without a good reason they will hate you as well even though you're bearing so much fruit even though you're being such a blessing even though all that you're doing is good they will hate you without a reason and you will suffer persecution so um, that is why he says in verse 26 and verse 27 you know he talks about how um, the helper he will uh, help them to testify about jesus uh, maybe we would need to look at that chunk mm, all right if someone could read out all the way from verse 26 you know in chapter 15 verse 26 get into 16 as well read up to verse 4 because uh, that's like one portion with one thought from verse 26 up to verse 4 of the next chapter verse 26 uh, but when the helper comes whom i shall send to you from the father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father he will testify of me and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning these things i have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble they will put you out of the synagogues yes the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you, I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you as the, at the beginning because it, I was with you. So Jesus says, because you have been chosen by me for fruitfulness, because I have chosen you out of the world, the world will hate you. And at that time, you'll really need the helper because he will show you how to continue partnering with God. So we are not out here, um, you know, just uh, to be blessed. We also have a responsibility. We are partnering with the Holy Spirit and testifying about Jesus. So the Holy Spirit will give us the words I know, as and when we need them uh, to be able to continue testifying about Jesus. And hopefully through our testimony of Jesus, many will get to know him. They will want to come and, you know, come into the kingdom. And then there'll be some who will reject what we are testifying. And, you know, may their judgment be upon their heads uh, because they have rejected Jesus. So um, uh, this, this, this work to be done, this life is not just about getting blessed and having the father answer our prayers um this also something that we are engaged in actively we are in the in the in the business of partnering with the holy spirit himself in testifying about jesus in bearing witness to all that he has said so jesus says i'm telling you all this now because i don't want you to fall away in fact the people who are opposing you without any good reason, they will think that they are doing God a great service when they 
uh, you know, uh, when, when they when they persecute you, they'll think that they're actually doing something which God approves of when they persecute you. But the fact is, they're actually working against God. So uh, this would have made so much sense to the first time readers, you know, with that original audience of uh, John, because they were being thrown out of the synagogues. The synagogue leaders were thinking that they're doing a really good and noble thing by throwing them out and ostracizing them, you know, excommunicating them uh, from all social activities and all of that. They were thinking that they were doing God a service. And so at that time, these believers should not think to themselves, if all the leadership is saying one thing, maybe they are right and maybe we were wrong. So Jesus says, I don't want you to fall away. I want you to hold on to the truth because uh, the leaders will lead you in the wrong direction. So hold on to what I am telling. And the helper, when he comes, he will remind you of these things and he will help you to testify to me and he will help you to continue to bear correct witness. So these are things which the uh, which the Lord is telling the disciples because you know his, this is his final hour and he's, give, he's now imparting his final instructions to them. Um, and, uh, okay, moving on from there, um, yeah, he says it's good, it is good for you, uh, if I go away, because unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. And then once he comes, you know, he will be able to, um, help you in testifying about me. So he says in, uh, verse eight, eight, verses eight to 10, you know, rather, um, popular verses. So yes, maybe we can focus on those verses. Uh, if someone could read out John 16, 8 to 11. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more because of righteous men, judgment, because of the ruler of this world, it judged. Yeah. So here, uh, you know, in this very, very popular verse, it's talking about the role of the Holy Spirit. You know, in uh, what way are we partnering with him? Um, we, you know, in our own words, in our own way, we share about Jesus with people. And then he's the one who does the uh, bigger part. He does the inner work. You know, we can only talk from outside, but he works inside the hearts of those people that we are talking to. And this is basically what he does. It, he, it's, it says in the NIV, you know, which is simpler English, he says, when he comes, you know, when this Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, about righteousness and about judgment. So he will prove to them, he will convict them in their hearts that they are wrong about three things. In their eyes, sin is something very terrible. You know, if you do, if you murder someone, that is sin. Maybe if you steal from someone, that is sin. But other things are not sin. But you know, what is actually sin? Sin is rejecting Jesus. Because he says in verse 9, about sin, because people do not believe in me. Sin is not just doing murder or stealing from a bank. Sin literally is not believing in Jesus not accepting that sacrifice which is being freely given to you. If you don't accept that as your only way to the Father, then that is sin. So you are condemned, you stand condemned. So the Holy Spirit will convict people and reveal to them that their definition of these things is wrong. And he will convict them that what we, you know, in our own simple words are trying to tell, that is the truth. We are bearing witness to what Jesus has taught us. And uh, so, even as we partner with the Holy Spirit, he will go inside the person's heart and convict them first regarding sin. He will tell them that their definition of sin is wrong and he will tell them what the true definition is. And second, he will convict them regarding righteousness. People think that if they do good works, if they give money to the poor, if they uh, don't tell lies, then they are righteous. But the Holy Spirit will convict and reveal to the people that righteousness only comes because Jesus went to the Father and the sacrifice of himself, which he presented before the Father, 
was acceptable in the father's eyes. The father um, considered this propitiation acceptable in his eyes. And that's the only reason why you and I have righteousness. Because what Jesus did was considered acceptable. All that punishment was, you know, um, which was released upon Jesus, which Jesus paid for, what the payment which Jesus made was considered satisfactory. And therefore, now Jesus is able to impart his righteousness to us. That's the only true definition of righteousness. Doing good works does not make you righteous. Um, uh, doing charity does not make you righteous. So the Holy Spirit also convicts the people regarding what is actually righteousness. And the Holy Spirit convicts regarding judgment. So in verse 11, Jesus says about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So the judgment is meant to come upon the Satan and his evil spirits, not upon people. Anyone, however rotten they are, if they can run to Jesus, to his covering and submit to him, they will be saved. The judgment is not meant for them. The judgment is meant to come upon the evil one. But if they choose to partner with the evil one and take his side, then sadly they too will come under judgment. So the Holy Spirit convicts the people of these things. But he needs our mouths to do that. So it is so important what we share with people. Of course, you know, when you're talking one-on-one -on -one -on -one with somebody, you can't exactly start preaching to them. So depending on the circumstances, you know, which have been presented to you, the helper will tell you what words to use. He will help you to bear witness uh, about Christ. But when a person is giving a formal message, you know, from the stage, a salvation message, I think these are things which should be touched upon. I mean, if the person just you know, talks, gives a nice story about uh, uh, the, what's that, um, that um, backslidden guy who, go, what, do you, what do you call him, prodigal, ah, the, you, know, you just tell a nice story about the prodigal who went away and then the father, when he came back, the father welcomed him with open arms and you end the gospel sermon, is the crowd going to be converted of sin, righteousness and judgment? So I think maybe a little more flesh should be added to sermons which are given about salvation especially if you're holding a meeting, you know, salvation meeting, and you want people to hear the true gospel, please bring in aspects of this, these three things, sin, righteousness, judgment. What is actually sin in God's eyes? What is actually righteousness in God's eyes? What is the dangerous judgment which is like hanging upon your heads? Let them know those truths. Just telling them a story about a dad welcoming back his son with open arms is not the whole message. Because only when we open our mouths and give the good news, then the Holy Spirit can do his work of conviction, right? If we are only doing some storytelling, how can he do his work of conviction? So we need to partner with him, you know, using the wisdom which he gives us. So that would be very important. Of course, in one-on-one in one -on -one interactions, we just use the words which the Lord is giving us. We can't, of course, preach at people. They will not like it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, moving on from there, as we have just five minutes left, um, you know, in verses uh, 16 onwards, Jesus says, um, you know, because they, these, these guys are still kind of feeling really bad because Jesus said, I'm going away, and they're worried how they're going to manage. He's comforting them and telling them, don't worry, I'll send you another Alos advocate, but still they're not very, very comforted. So now again, he says to them, in, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. And so then the disciples are very puzzled and they're wondering, you know, what does he mean? He's going, he's, we won't see him for a little while. And then after a little while, again, we will see him. They don't really understand. And so then in verse 19, Jesus says, um, he says, uh, in a little while, you will see me no more. Uh, but very truly, I tell you, you will weep and moan while the re world rejoices. However, a day will come when like this woman who is giving birth, you know, you're pain will be turned into joy. Okay, so we have no time to, you know, go through those verses properly. Uh, and so just to kind of um, summarize the whole thing here, uh, that word which Jesus is talking about when he says, in a little while, you will not see me, but in a little while, you'll again see me. You know, it sounds like as if it sounds like five minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, so, but we've been waiting for the second coming for you know, uh, quite a long time now. 
so it may sound like as if what jesus said is wrong so let's understand that phrase that is used over there when it says a little while you know in a, in a little while you will see me no more and then after a little while you will see me that word a little while is the greek word mikron which can talk about a measure of time you know a short amount of time but it can also refer to something insignificant something unimportant so basically what jesus is saying is you know the waiting may feel like a long time but that long wait is so insignificant compared to the great joy which you are going to receive at the end of it so over here when it talks about little while it's you know it's 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 a, it's a wrong english translation because maybe if they had used the phrase you know an insignificant amount of time it would bring it out more accurately so what jesus the point that jesus is making over here is we are going to go through tough times there's going to be opposition it's not going to be easy but all of this is just insignificant if you can just hold on for this little bit of time you will have all of eternity to rejoice when that you know when that when that mother is going through the pains of childbirth and it feels so terribly painful um all of that will be forgotten once the child is born and then she can hold that child in her arms day after day after day year after year and watch the child grow up and get married and get a job and all of that you know this in this lifetime waiting so that this that those few hours of pain are insignificant compared to the great lengthy period of joy which is going to come later so in that sense he's telling them you know um, yes right now you will weep and you will mourn uh, in fact you know because he's talking about his crucifixion after that he will show his face to them for a few days then he'll be taken away into heaven uh, but the point that he's making is in the long run there is great joy awaiting so hold on that is what he wishes to uh, convey um and so uh, he's talking about how once he ascends into heaven and the helper has come he says in that day you will no longer ask me anything very truly i tell you my father will give you whatever you asked in my name and he repeats that in verse 26 he says in that day you will ask in my name i am not saying that i will ask the father on your behalf you you yourselves can directly go to him and ask and he'll give you what you want because you will be asking in my name he says that is so when we do our asking we should ask uh, in a way that represents his name are we asking out of selfish motives or are we asking in a way which truly represents his name you see because asking in his name is not a formula you can't say lord i want a mansion and a car and i want this and that in jesus name and expect that the formula will come through no over there that, that that phrase in jesus name is talking about what his name represents his name represents a certain set of standards his name represents a certain purpose and will his name represents the things of god so if you are asking in line with all the things which his name represents then yes you will most definitely be granted what you are asking for because you are asking it in line with his name in line with all that his name represents so you don't have to like you know wait for jesus to intercede for you he says you can directly go to the father and ask he'll give you what you need so that is the authority that we have in jesus okay our time is up so we'll close with a word of prayer we thank you o lord for the high status which uh, we see for ourselves in all of these chapters lord uh, we were just slaves once upon a time uh, we were trampled upon we were oppressed but now lord we are friends of the almighty god and lord you the holy spirit is partnering with us humans to accomplish divine purposes uh we we've, we've been given a very high status oh lord very grand privileges so we pray oh lord that we will walk in an awareness of this and remain in your love within the safe boundaries of your love so that we can enjoy the zoe life that we are meant to have we pray that you would do these things for us lord thank you lord in jesus name amen thank you